on coming right in your face and you don't know I mean how did you miss it last time so uh, <laughs> that's basically what happened to me so I have to apologize and uh, uh, with book five uh, which is in English for some reason that uh, is called strains we'll talk about the name later I was kind of usually like just skipping over it thinking it's uh, not really significant and I couldn't really understand well I mean I, I thought it was just a, a, a by way of introduction to uh, Ivan's argument in the next chapter but um, getting ready for today's class uh, I uh, changed my mind and uh, decided to talk about this book for the whole uh, class today because I think here we see there is one specific purpose and now I understand why I, I well I have to humble myself I think I understand why it's called what it's called because it's about this this type of self that uh, Ivan has and some other characters in this chapter have uh, where you deny the dark part of yourself as essential to who you are uh, and you try to cut it off and, and, and you try to cleanse yourself of that part and, and try to be just the, just the good part. So basically getting rid of all the passions and all the animal and all the dark stuff and, and, and say, you know, as far as who I am as a human being, I'm just this good part. So here, we will get a look at where such an attitude in life leads you to, and we'll see different examples of, of the same attitude in different settings, basically. So I don't like how it's translated, the strains, because in the, the Russian word that he has for it, it, it means more like a tears. What's the Russian word? Nadriv. Nadriv. Tear is not like you're crying it's tear, but when you tear something tear. apart. So that's a why... Tear. A tear. tear. Thank tear. you, Bob. Yeah, my daughter is much better in uh, <laughs> <laughs> English than I am as you were witness to. So basically what it means is to rip in two. It's not just tear it into small pieces, but you know, have something which is a whole and then rip it apart in two pieces. And it immediately, if you understand the title of the book, then it kind of connects to the fact that this is what he's going to be talking about, about the people who tear their dark side as they think and then just become, you know, the good part. But as we know from our first class, it's not going to be possible. And that's what Pascal was, was talking about. So no matter how hard you try to get rid of the bad side, it will always be with you uh, because it's just part of human nature and uh, there is no human uh, without it. So having said that, <coughs> uh, we can, s let's just go through, uh, uh, let's just go through the chapter and see. And 
it starts with a some somewhat uh, I mean at least for an outside observer uh, a sort of paradox where Elder Zosima is talking it's basically right on the second page there page 164 in these books uh, if people have it so you know Elder Zosima is about to die and uh, he sort of gives this last instructions to uh, to people around him um, and if I could ask Father John to read sure. so that I don't say tear instead of care again instead of just this and just tear again what, what, what is that the chapter? Uh, chapter 5 oh. Chapter oh, book, book, book 5, five. chapter 1 second chapter page one. in that chapter but when he knows that he is not only worse than all those in the world, but is also guilty before all people, on behalf of all and for all, for all human sins, the worlds, and each person's, only then will the goal of our unity be achieved. For you must know, my dear ones, that each of us is undoubtedly guilty on behalf of all and for all and for all on earth, not only because of the common guilt of the world, but personally, each one of us, for all the people and for all, for each person on this earth. <coughs> Thank you, Father John. So, immediately, you have this contrast between somebody trying to be so pure that he is just good, and right at the beginning, Elder Zosima saying that everybody, and he makes the point to say even especially the monks, are in this state of being guilty before all people. And on the one hand, it's a very exaggerated and even paradoxical claim, especially you know, in, in that 19th century age when the world was so much less connected compared to how we are now. To say that Bob is guilty for the suffering children in Malaysia, for example, <laughs> where he's never been and probably <laughs> will never be. But that's at least it seems what Elder Zosima is claiming, right? If if you if you literally take what he says that each and every one of us is guilty before all people. But is that what he's powder? Sorry, is that what he meant? I thought he was just talking about like ancestral sin or something like that. Um, well, no, because I don't think he goes to the original. He talks about the original sin because um, because what he says that we are guilty before all people on behalf of all and for all. Well, this is part of the uh, divine liturgy where we make an offering but then uh, he says but personally each one of us for all people and for each person on this earth so literally if we take it literally that's what that's what he means but so what what I think what's going on here of course we have we Few people would agree with the literal meaning of what of what he is saying, but then on the other hand, he uh, what he is trying to do is to say basically to set up this contrast with Ivan and with people who will say, you know, I'm so pure, I'm above everybody else. So people in this state will definitely say, well, I have nothing to do with all these people. You know, I'm good and pure. I'm not guilty for anyone. Well, if you look at the, what we've covered in the book so far, you see that it's easy to dislike the father. He is a buffoon. He calls himself a buffoon. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be a little smirky about Ivan. It's, uh, it's easier to like Alyosha. He's got a good heart, you know, and all that. So you find yourself liking and disliking, and that's the very thing that the elder is talking about. He's saying that, no, no, we have to love everybody. Everybody, we, we're in it with for everyone, not just the people we like or who are nice or who have good personalities. And it, it's like it's for everybody. Yeah, and disliking the father later on, we will see how all this, his 
sons disliking him or specifically one who dislikes him but and pretends to be so good and pure will be implicated in so many ways in his father's death even though physically he had nothing to do with it that's on the one hand but also he then if there are any people who could claim here on earth that you know they're pure and clean as much as possible for a human being to be then monks would be the first sort of in line you know to claim that status right but then father zosima says since he knows how things really are right he is the guy who knows that people are contradictory and each part is essential so dostoevsky says through father zosima about specifically about the monks that they are worse than all those who are in the world because they sort of in his word are hiding behind monasteries walls from uh, you know having to deal with world's problems so to speak and so all of this you know goes as, as a contrast to to uh, to Ivan and also if we then say that Elder Zosima, like all of us, should recognize that the dark side is an essential part of being a human being, then again, this claim, beca claim becomes more plausible because no matter how hard we try, the darkness will, will always be in us and that way we will always be guilty before I was thinking things. about the elder. What irritates the... Uh, the father and uh, the uncle and all the various people we've run into he, when the elder is saying oh forgive me forgive me he's begging forgiveness and they're going what a phony you know they're, they're, they're just like this is not real no one is that good no one is that good and the elder's going but forgive me because I'm not that good and they, you know so it becomes this uh, um, almost it's just like a, a, it goes around and around uh, and then and and then you have the monks who are going, oh no, he's very holy and fine. No, I'm not. I'm forgiving you a sinner. I mean, the elder has a real handle on what's really going on, whereas the others are just sort of bouncing off of his virtue in a way. And um, another thing, the last thing that Dostoevsky is doing here is, is he is preparing us for the next chap, for the next book, book six, where Ivan will play a role of the accuser, accuser of the faith, accuser of Christianity and, and God's world from the position of a man who is all pure uh, and good and you know here Dostoevsky is, reminds us to keep this in mind that even monks are not all good and pure and in that way he gives us ammunition uh, sort of he gives us tools to deal with Ivan's argument against God in the next book. So keep it in mind and, uh, and prepare yourself for next time. Um, and, another <coughs> and another thing that he, uh, he does here, uh, why we are guilty before all people, is another side of Ivan his title in the newspaper was the observer and that's the position that he takes in the world where he is not involved same thing in the family he's sort of living there observing the vipers as it says in, in this book vipers eating each other and he is so uh, he has such a detached position presumably at least that's what he would like to think of himself and Zosima by telling this says no no one who is living no living human being can claim to be an observer and he will explain it later uh, in the later books he will give such an examples where say you walk past a small child with an angry face and, and, and bad words coming out of your mouth you didn't notice that the small child was you know observing you but you could have affected this child for the rest of his life because he witnessed you know something really something really bad or you know he would think that behaving in such a way is okay and which goes back to this you know modern science saying that 
you know, the early childhood experience, like the children learn not so much by the social instincts take place just through observation of family, you know, general so like social setting, like fa you know, extended family, school, preschool, things like that. They learn and act not what they've been told, you know, this is good and this is bad, but what they see, how people, you know, older people around them behave and what they, not so much what they say, but what they do. So this is what they take their cues mostly from that. And in that way, we don't know how many people we might have affected throughout our long life and those bad things that we might not even think to be bad but that could have affected other people as they were witnesses to our behavior or or things like that am i making myself clear here yes so this is what he means that you know we may we may not even know how guilty we are you know by affecting all these people around us as we go on and carry on our daily lives Basically, everyone is guilty. No one's existing. So then at the end, we have to agree with him that we are all guilty. And then what I was saying in the beginning, in our modern age where everything is like out there and the behavior could be observed through, you know, the social media, internet, and blah, blah, blah. This saying is even more true than it was in the 19th century where the world was much more isolated and compartmentalized place. But here we have presumption of innocence, and Christian religion has presumption of guilt. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. So um, I think um, I think we are now ready to move on to uh, uh, next. I think it's next chapter two, where we see new character. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't sorry. Go ahead. I just, I, I, um, so what, kind of what you meant by that was to me like through our everyday actions um, we do things that we don't realize is creating are things. affecting other people. But is and yes. That's what you mean by that? What I mean by that? Well, I mean saying you come in here to this class. Uh, you were driving or walking? Driving. Driving. So driving on the road, you know. How many times you could find yourself where you're like, oh, this, you know, not good person, you know, cut me off, or you know, I sh I wanted to go right and he blocked me and things like that, mm -hmm. and the person who you are thinking that about, right, is most of most likely is even unaware, unless you let him know by you know honking. <laughs> Or, or swearing him would most likely go unaware of that, you know, you affected him in a bad way. So that would be, you know, just a small example yeah. of something like that. Yeah. But like, the world might not say we're guilty of anything. No, we have to realize. It's not the world is coming and telling Same us shit. you are guilty. It's you looking into yourself and looking into how world have is to have to realize to that's why he is an elder like he is he is the guy in the book who knows how things are really are and that's why this is coming from him because he knows that this is the case in reality i think he was like um, almost like I, I, idealist idealist and yes idealist. true and he he thought that everybody is sinful but children. That the children no, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, o o o uh, well, I mean, he definitely wasn't St. Augustine or like that Catholic tradition that would say, you know, the, that, you know, children are guilty by the uh, original sin from the birth. That's why in, in the Orthodox tradition, it's, you know, we have this assumption until they are seven years old, you know, they are not subject to uh, any rules because they are considered to be uh, 
you know, pure and, uh, yeah. and yeah. pure. <laughs> well, anybody who is a parent here knows that it's not true. <laughs> but um, basically, all of this, 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 the question of uh, children and and where they can be seen as as some somehow guilty will come up in the next uh, book six that will become you know we will analyze it much more deeply but at this stage this is uh, probably as much as I want to say about it definitely um, it's 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 more like adults are guilty before children because children observe them and observe their behavior and and this is how they learn and all this sinfulness is going through I'll be uh, I'm guilty of not having read that book That's so I, can, I can't talks about it when children say that all adults are funny really? because they say one thing and they do completely different thing well I definitely find myself uh, often uh, you know realizing that you know I'm saying one thing and, and doing another and I'm sure my children can attest to that and, but I always like ask uh, forgiveness say it again they're agreeing with you oh yeah I can see their heads nodding as they as forgive as you children mm -hmm. all, all right so I think I actually like the way it's going uh, you know, I thought it will be more uh, more dry, but I like all these comments that are coming up. So I think uh, we're ready to look at Father Therapon, which uh, is uh, is it chapter two? Sixty six. Excuse me for a second. Uh, actually, it is still uh, still the, the first chapter. Uh, so. In animal kingdom, we have, I don't know why I have this example, but we have one sort of way to be dominant, right? If, if it's, if it's uh, some sort of animals, we have a social structure, you become dominant by, you know, expressing power, authority, you know, all those passions, uh, collecting as much resources as possible, and, and so on. So you are dominant through, you know, these animal passions, which are also present in a human being. But I think it's only humans who have the second kind of dominance, and that's what Ivan has, but it's, it's shown through this monk, Fairpon, where you dominate through abstinence. That's what I call it, that you are you get you you claim to be consistent only of the good part you fast you are holy than holy but then what does that monk end up doing he is sort of you know claiming now authority saying you know those things that they do they are not correct they are not the christian way this is not how it's supposed to be done and and things like that so this is, but in, in among animals, I don't think it's possible. So it's this this specific human way to uh, to dominate the social group, not through grabbing things and having as many things as possible, but through actual abstinence and 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 like being uh, uh, I don't know how to say the not needful anything, being so pure and living like. St. John the Baptist by the Kanyan locusts. But except that St. John the Baptist had a different idea of what he was doing. And whereas among, uh, you know, among real human beings that, that we are at least, uh, such an attitude is basically equivalent to Ivan's because he then, again, his position is to be an observant who is not touched by anything is detached from uh, these all these bad things that, that are happening around him and same thing <coughs> I think is happening with Father Therapon uh, 
also if we it's uh, in this book it's on pages it's still like three or, or four or five pages into into the first chapter and this is what uh, Dostoevsky says on page 166 about uh, Father Fairpont. He was dangerous mainly because many brothers fully sympathized with him. And among visiting laymen, many honored him as a great ascetic and righteous man, even though they regarded him as unquestionably a holy fool. Indeed, it was this that fascinated them. So he... Basically, what he did, he provided destruction. We talked about the, the father, the Theodore, the father of the family, that his way, his personality in life, his way in life is to be destructed. And same thing, his female double, Koklokova, is wants to be unused and destructed. So this is what Father Ferropon does. He distracts people because, well... First of all, he does all these these jokes that he did with a um, visiting monk, resemble exactly what uh, Theodore did earlier in the book, where he was, you know, joking around in the elder cell and, and, and amusing everyone. But also, he's uh, he's a little bit like Smerdyakov, where he doesn't have much reason, but he just, you know poses questions that have no answer or behave himself in such an odd way that people are like wow you know it definitely must mean something even though that there is no meaning behind it and same thing with his these sort of predictions or or prophecies that he would make you know he would just make some say something so obscure that anybody who is willing could put meaning into this obscurity and says, oh, this is what he meant, you know, he was so right, and so on and so forth. So be, uh, be on the uh, lookout for, uh, for people like that, you know, pretending to, uh, to have some deeper knowledge which is not there. Well, one of the, <coughs> the, the correlation between this and when we did our classes on Father Seraphim Rose's Orthodox worldview is that after the schism with Rome, and you had this, um, <clears throat> as you get toward past the Middle Ages, Renaissance, you get these, you get these people that are starting to ask questions about things that don't have any, they don't really matter. They, they don't matter in terms of faith and belief and following Jesus, but they're kind of put out there almost to distract people. And so people start getting kind of lost in that because they start to believe more and more in, in reason and logic which is kind of what Ivan is. He's sort of this reason and logic kind of person. Uh, detached and, of course, these questions in the kind of in the ethers and anyway. But uh, this is even worse than that. We'll get, actually, we have this passage next which fits exactly your, this, this what just Father John was talking about where he talks about this age of reason. But just to finish with Father Fairpoint, this is another description of him on page 167. He merely uttered some one strange saying which always posed a great riddle for the visitor and then, despite all entreaties, would give no further explanation. You know, so he's, he's basically this sort of trickster that wants to dominate by, you know, creating such an enigmatic <coughs> image of himself and, and being such an ascetic not eating, you know, eating just bread and, 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 and drinking just water. And, and this is basically a warning sign to say that even if this is the path that you take and you think, you know, you will be this great and holy man, it, you can fall down from that path as quickly as from, you know, indulging your passions. Blind leading the blind. <laughs> yes, blind leading the blind. So, and, and right at the end of this chapter one, uh, since you mentioned it, you will have to read it. Okay. I think it's a very famous passage. About that's when Father Paisi tells Alexei his last instruction. Yeah, the yellow part. Yeah. That the science of this world, having united itself into a great force, has especially in the past century 
examined everything heavenly that has been bequeathed to us in sacred books. And after hard analysis, the learned ones of this world have absolutely nothing left of what was once holy. But they have examined parts and missed the whole, and their blindness is even worthy of wonder. Meanwhile, the whole stands before their eyes as immovably as ever, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I think this is hits the exactly. spot yeah. of your class with Stephen on the uh, yeah. modern age and science. So I remind you that we mentioned right at the beginning that his project in this book is to defend Christianity in the age of science and reason. Uh, and this, in this piece he basically says that Christianity, unlike the specific sciences, even the physics, you know, that supposed to, you know, have this world view of the world as a whole, you know, from great to the smallest, what we witness now, it gets more and more compartmentalized or, or more and more narrowed down. People look at this, finding this smaller and smaller and smaller particle and they can't stop or you know, people have these big theories about, you know, what the universe is and the Big Bang. All in all, the inner condition of the human person hasn't changed through all these, through all these years. And he's saying that only Christianity... <coughs> I think the next thing I want to talk about, which is also in this chapter, uh, again, it's uh, another theme that gets repeated throughout the book. You know, no magic in Christianity. You know, he will. We will have later on miracles without magic. But here is just he sets it up for a later episode in the ne in the seventh book, where he says, "Well, everyone he was expecting miracles upon the death of the elder Zosimus. Everybody knows elder is dying. He, he will die very soon. And here we have." You know, to quote, everyone expected something immediate and great upon the elders falling asleep. And again, in this book, at least in, in the view of Dostoevsky, anybody who is waiting for something supernatural to happen is going to be disappointed. This is not how the world is. Uh, so we have similar to Father Ferropont, we have this episode with a le letter from the lady's son. So remember when way before there were all these peasant women visiting Elder Zosima and one had the son who traveled and she lost track of him. So the elder tells her, you know, go back home, pray for him. You know, you will hear, you know, he will, if he's alive, you will, you will hear from him. And so happens that next day she receives a letter that yes, her son is alive and he is coming back and everything is well. Well, for people who are waiting for the, for the supernatural, they take this coincidence and say, oh, you know, Elder, he is a prophet, he knew the letter would come next day and you know, this is a great miracle and so on and so forth. People make up stuff, you know, those, those people who... And, and another thing is, of course, uh, it's much easier to live waiting for a miracle than actually having to do something for yourself. For example, you can go to a doctor and ask for a pill to get healthy, right? And, you know, you'll pay whatever ridiculous amount of money, but also... <laughs> and it doesn't happen, but yeah, time after time, <laughs> this is this is the conversation in the doctor's office. You know, just give me that pill, you know, and stop telling me to exercise. You know, gain weight, lose weight, whatever that work that the doctor is telling you to do. You know, you'd rather avoid that route and just take the medicine and wake up a different person next day. Same thing here in the, in the uh, religious realm. People are eager, you know, for a miracle, for some elder or some magician, you know, lay his hands on him or some 
miracle icon that you only have to touch and, and all the problems in the world will be solved for you and what Dostoevsky is saying no you know this is not how this is not how it works and he's setting up this big failure that is going to happen with all these people waiting for a miracle in a few uh, books later so he's setting up this picture where everybody is expecting something supernatural where is expectation and people will be justly disappointed you know with, with their uh, waiting for uh, so just to say a comment just on that is in today's world people almost view the sacraments the same way as mm -hmm. magic even people come in they say I'm sick I want an unction service they're expecting to go to the doctor and the cancer is gone you know and that's not really the promise of any service or any particular thing although in Christ all things are possible to them that believe so it's possible, but it's not magic. It doesn't, you know, just by waving your hand doesn't make it go away. But and Jesus so does it. We, come, mm -hmm. we become very superstitious. Yes, superstition. That's a very, a very good word for what Dostoevsky is trying to warn against and, and get rid of superstition in, uh, in, in uh, Christianity. So, and also this, this goes to show that even monks who again, if there are any people who are all good and all clean and all pure, if there are any people like that on earth, monks are first in line. So here with monks waiting, sincerely waiting for a miracle and expecting a miracle, it, it goes to show that even they are prone to, uh, to mistakes and prone to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be fallen, so to speak. But in Christianity, how a person announced to be a saint? By uh, doing miracles, if you don't do miracles, you cannot be saint. Not necessarily. No, it is. How can you be? Well, I mean, playing saint if you don't do any miracles. I don't want to like kind of slide into the discussion about all the different types of saints. You know, like for example, no, no, I, I'm just saying that uh, it's a view of the state. The emperor Nikolai right didn't view. perform any miracles, yet he is considered to be a saint, and, and like. You know, no, we're not like talking about emperor. This is a, a slightly different story. But we know saints who did miracles. Well, they heal people or they predict stuff. So there is a certain <coughs> aspect of it present. Well, again, but denying it, it doesn't make him absolutely right. It's yes, just his point of view. Yes, but to uh, no, I I I take I grant you your point. But again, I said from the very beginning what we are talking about here is not the dogmatic uh, version of the orthodoxy this is quite often may you know this is why this book was basically banned from public circulation is you know among other people by the the the, the church itself because what he has here is not exactly the the dogmatic teaching of the church but the way that people miss quite often and the way that he explains it in the book is that he has and this is basically me jumping ahead but basically we'll, we'll talk about it in detail later but I'll just to answer your question he has three stages of Christianity of like historic Christianity there was this early uh, early church early stage right after Jesus Christ uh, came and, and was resurrected and ascended into heaven and how many um, centuries it took but it was this early church then there was this uh, monastic period where people had to go back to the monasteries to make sense and provide all these writings and explanations of what it was that happened during this you know when when Christ was here and the, during the early church and then we have third sta stage which is our modern age where like people are supposed to come out of the monasteries and where miracles of the early times are no longer 
permitted, so to speak. You know, they are no they longer. Exist. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying they don't. Them. I'm just. I'm explaining to you the. No, I understand. I'm just trying to say that his opinion. It's his opinion. And yours it's opinion is opinion. yours opinion too. Yes. In the same way, and my opinion is my is my opinion. Yes. But we are here to uh, try to learn something new by trying to figure out what 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 is the opinion of the author here and what solution to all these problems he is offering and whether or not we agree with it or not i think this is a fair point um so having to talk about all of this uh, then there is uh, this the the only introduction which is there just for the sake of introduction are the uh, the schoolboys uh, they will play a more important role later on uh, and one thing that this chapter about the schoolboys in this book illustrates is this that we are guilty before all people because why kids are having a conflict why are they throwing rocks at each other because Dmitri you know, kick the hell out of one of the boys, of the boys' father. And they witnessed it. And so this conflict between Dmitri and I forgot the name of the father. The, what do you call him? The beer? The, the, the captain. Yeah, he's captain. Captain. He's the captain. Stop's capital. Dmitri and the captain completely unrelated about some debts, some money, you know, whatever, some dirty dealings. In the adult world, all of a sudden come down and then you have the schoolboys throwing rocks at each other because of something that happened, you know, completely unrelated to them. So I think this is just his first in illustration how you know we are guilty before all people how Dmitri is guilty for the suffering that the, uh, the this uh, boy or, or Ilya how for the suffering of the Ilya that, that, that he has to uh, go through uh, right now and after the brothers I think this is the last but not the least important point is uh, we get to see female equivalent of Ivan's character to remind you it's Katerina in the book who has the same type of self who is trying to be all good uh, and uh, you know in her female way so to speak let's look at her and by the way I, I skipped over uh, this uh, episode when uh, the father of the family is, is talking to Alexei and they discuss Ivan That's right. <laughs> uh, and it's on page 175 uh, I mean in this edition but it's chapter 2 kind of halfway through uh, uh, on chapter 2 I like his uh, just before we get there I like his saying that he plans to live on this earth as long as possible and therefore will need every penny and the longer I live the more I'll need it nothing what he needs those money for he didn't yeah say. well we'll we'll skip that part <laughs> <laughs> but that's because the older he gets the more money he will need, he will need but uh, <laughs> A few pages later, he talks about Ivan, and you know he has this cute, acute observation, and he says to Alexei, "But Ivan loves nobody; he is not one of us." So we have this uh, trait that he says about Ivan. And Katerina, a little bit later, uh, on page 187, 
I think it's the last chapter in this uh, book. Let me see. Uh, yes, yeah, chapter five uh, on the second page there, and then Alex Alex is observing her, and s and and this is what he thinks: What if she, Katerina, loves no one, neither one, meaning the brother, nor nor another? So we have saying about her that she loves. Is there two O's? <laughs> you know, it's two words, no one. I would think. It's two O's. <laughs> it's two O's. <laughs> it's that, um, this is well, at least in the book, it's two words, no and one. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two words. Uh, well, basically, so we see that he basically uses exactly the same, uh, exactly the same wording characteristic. Ivan loves nobody, and Katerina loves no one, and. Now that we know how the human self, you know, works and what every human has, it should be apparent why neither of them is able to love. Because, well, at least for certain meaning of the word love, it has to come from the passionate. I mean, the dark side is not the only way to, to call it, right? It's the earthly side is where all the passions reside and so on and so forth so at least in the sense that they're talking like at least for her you know they're talking about the romantic sort of love it's definitely 100 percent in the uh, in the dark side of the of the self uh, and then uh, for Ivan same same thing so if you are and you can say the same about Father Ferrapon. He loves no one, you know, neither those visitors who admire him, nor Elder Zosima, who is like his adversary, and so on and so forth. So here we have the first danger of trying to live this way and trying to uh, put all your effort into making yourself this reasonable, rational philosopher who is just pure reason you will end up not being able to love anyone, either romantically or in a bigger sense, as we said, the, the Christian agape love. Can you explain that a little bit? Why, why, you, can, why you take that conclusion? If you're purely rational, you're not able to... Well, again, I mean, if with romantic love, it's easy, right? You understand what I'm talking about. Because, you know, romantic love by definition involves the the passionate part right because it involves the the you know animal sexual drive and this is what this dark part is any whatever that we inherited from animals is is in that part so then you know if we are talking just about the romantic side if you don't have that you know how that's it. There is no place where that love can come from. You understand that? <laughs> it was the, uh, love yeah. is there. You just cannot consummate it. Oh no! Okay. But like you said But we, yeah. But this one, I think it's uh, it's uh, more difficult because, of course, the, this is a very different, very different type of love, and. Um, well, basically, it will take the whole book, you know, up to. No, it's like literally up to the epilogue where it will be, you know, this is why I don't want to like give it all out now, or, you know, in the epilogue he will reveal, you know, why you have to be Karamazov, you know, and which, as we talked about what it means, you have to have this passionate part to, you know, do any good in the world, and uh, basically, if you have say if if you are just this rational part i think it's easy to see how you will be indifferent right if you just re reason if you are just this rational being that has no passions you will be indifferent to everything that's what basically ivan is trying to be you know this oh, detached 
Спасибо. From the world, but to love the world, to be in the loving relationship, you cannot be detached, you cannot be in this observer position that Ivan is in, right? Even for, especially for this love. This is why, like, elder always uh, it makes it equivalent to active love, right? That you have to go and do something, that it's not just contemplation, you know, on your philosopher couch type of love. It's kind of like in church, just you have to come and do the work. It's not just sitting and, you know, say, yeah, I go to church and I believe in God. That too, that too. But even like one-to-one, -one, you know, when there are just these two people involved, you know, you ha it has to be, if it's one is indifferent, then, you know, there is no love, even in that sense. Mm. I hope I say Dostoevsky here. Well, I, <coughs> I don't want to. I'm just, I was just thinking like, um, you know, in the West they have this whole idea of existentialism and the mm -hmm. sort of atheistic version of existentialism where a person just is like, I'm like a robot, he goes, well, I like this, well, I like that, I like this, and then it's all like, whatever I like is all good, it's all, it's just because that's good and then there's no definition of good or evil in any of that, and that's the opposite really of, um, and that in Ivan is like, well, it's all good. Whatever I see, whatever I want, whatever I desire, and detachment and all that. And so he misses the action that is, that is important, you know, of moving forth in love, not just studying about love or studying about what I like, but in love. Yeah. Is that higher agape love. And this is actually brings me back to what you started asking before the class started about this very uh, last episode where this uh, captain would not accept the money you know be offered to him even though that you know he is in need you know he's really poor and he really does need that money well on the one hand we have this scene of being prideful and even poor people especially you know Dostoevsky says especially poor people have this exaggerated sense of uh, pride on the one hand, but then I thought about it and I think here the Dostoevsky also shows that even the good deeds but without love, she doesn't love anyone, she's just doing the good deed, so even the good deeds without love will not bear the fruit. And uh, so, I, you know, among other things, uh, what he is doing here, I, I think, at least it seems to me, he's basically taking a shot, you know, uh, taking a job at um, the Western philosophy and especially these the, the Kantian morals, you know, we, we spoke before that, you know, here is advocated the, the divine command moral theory, the only one which takes its authority from outside of the human real. But then there are all these different other kinds of ethics and ethical theories uh, which are humans are trying to derive, you know, by their own reason. And one of them was, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, he lived about 100 years before this book been written. Uh, uh, yeah, um, ethics. Of beauty, you know. The, uh, I know if you've heard about it. He, he's famous for his moral imperative, and 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 basically his idea was: is once you recognize your duty, you will act on it. Not because you know, like it's it's uh, some God's commandment, but because just by pure exercise of your reason, you will deduce that this is the right thing to, to do. And just to illustrate, <coughs> uh, uh, just to illustrate, I wanted to read what she has here. Oh, oh that, there it is. And so she, Katerina, is speaking to Alexei. In these affairs, Alexei, in these affairs, the main thing now is honor and duty. And <coughs> mm -hmm. 
so this is how she starts that you know I don't need to love him as long as I act honorably and exercise my duty as I don't know whatever his guardian angel you know this will m move me and, and provide a motive for me to move forward so that's where she starts and then she ends with this and then she says I will be his God to whom he shall pray so you know this moral takes her from you know I will love him without loving him but just out of my duty <coughs> to the you know logical conclusion that oh I will be the God that he sh whom he shall worship just because I did all these good things for him as well so with Kant basically what happened is that you know he had all this nice rational theory that you shall do to other men that you wish they do to you and just realizing that will make you a good person and then in his own in his own journal he has this uh, remark that every morning he would wake up and remind him of his duty not to yell at his uh, servant who was like cleaning his coat and boots and everything and then at the end of every day he would write down no today again i yelled at him and you know <laughs> <laughs> and i called him the bad words and blah blah blah, blah. my moral <laughs> but i shall remind myself the moral imperative tomorrow <laughs> I, will, I will not do it again and that's how he lived for the rest of his life basically saying to you that having a, some sort of rational theory of ethics how why and how we should behave in a good way <coughs> does not guarantee that you actually live this way and this is why father mentioned you know like western existential writings and philosophy this is like orthodox existential writing in a sense it shows you how to live all those things that you know we learn in the church and in dogmas and in sacraments what they actually mean in our daily uh, lives and this takes me to the end of of today i think i'm finished with uh, book five and as i promised last time next time we will do antinomies so you have a little bit of tools and ammo trying to resist all this bad stuff that uh, ivan is going to do in the next book trying to uh, attack uh, christianity and, and, and religion and just to sh basically there will be two things uh, he will be saying that or you know trying to act attack religion on the grounds that there is evil in the world and you know if there is evil in the world it cannot be created by god or you know it has there is some flaws in god and then he will in his great inquisitor poem he will look at this uh, three temptation that our lord jesus christ had to go through uh, and then he will basically dostoevsky will give us the the meaning what was going on in those three temptations and well i'll give it up he will show that neither catholic nor protestant understanding gives us the uh, satisfactory solution that's why they're called antinomies or the whole chapter is called pro and contra because you will see two sides and why antinomies are called antinomies is that because they cannot be resolved on, on their own you have to have some third view from outside to make sense and you know I hope I did not confuse anyone but uh, I'll give you uh, some examples not from brothers K but from you know there is a source here just to see you know what the antinomies are and what's going on all right uh, yeah when uh next week um Anatole, you'll be without me but maybe our Deborah comes just to say I have yeah if with, your, town, with so. your blessing can we meet without yes. you yeah and uh so anyway just keep names all right. Well, I hope you'll see us on uh, some yeah, I'll turn it in after social the, media. After the lecture. I'm going up to Portland for a uh, uh, a conference. 
All right, we done? Yes, I'm yeah. done. Any questions? Uh, any sure. well, we're, not, we're gonna hold on to questions because I think all the questions we asked. Oh, oh, while yeah, well, it's still on, I wanted to say, like, for people who are watching, you can uh, put your questions in the comment section on the YouTube or Facebook, and then I'll try to answer them next time. Okay. Make your questions known. Everybody up. Joy of all the